Hey everybody, this is a, you know, kind of unique lecture. This is going to be an asynchronous meeting. Um, so that means we're not live right now. But with that in mind, the reason that I'm doing it this way is just because, you know, this is a, a, a shorter lecture. There's a little bit less to cover and we can kind of wrap up what we did on Wednesday. Now, with that in mind, what we are going to be talking about is kind of a continuation from Wednesday, and that is states of matter. And we're also going to pick up with one of the things that we were kind of resolving the other day, and that was inter and intramolecular forces. Now, to illustrate that, go ahead and jump back to this slide that we actually saw last time. And that is looking at, well, a substance, in this case it would be water, H2O, but we're looking at that substance in, you know, kind of a mixture of other water molecules. So we've got multiple water molecules. And this is awesome because it really captures the difference between an intermolecular force and an intramolecular force. So those are our two forces. Think about this almost as like you're, you're just misspelling a word intramolecular forces versus intermolecular forces. Your intermolecular forces are those that are between molecules. I know that I mentioned this the other day, but I always think about the interstate highway system. Now, a covalent bond is an example of an intramolecular force. Now, the reason that I'm defining a covalent bond as an example of an intramolecular force is because, well, a covalent bond is not an intermolecular force. And as it turns out, there's quite a few other forces that are intermolecular forces. We're going to get into those on Monday. But in the meantime, we're just going to talk about the kind of implications of this. So what we've got is basically, I think about inter and intramolecular forces as, well, my arm connects my hand to my body. If I'm walking around holding one of my kid's hands or my wife's hand or something like that, that would be an example of an intermolecular force, us holding hands, whereas my hand is connected to my body through an intramolecular force. So essentially, one way you could think about that is you could kind of think about like the strength of those two. Um, for me to lose the grip of one of my kids' hands when I'm holding their hand or something, that's just a matter of like, oh, we walk too far away from one another like that. And, you know, neither one of us is going to be that up upset or in pain or anything like that. Now, an intramolecular force, being my arm holding my hand to my body, well, that's a much stronger force. If my hand was ripped off of my body, well, you'd have to basically do something unpleasant to my arm. I'm sorry, that's kind of graphic, but there we go. Um, now, the way that these things interact through intermolecular forces are going to have an influence on the physical states that substances exist in. Now, we talked about this last time as well, and you know, these first three slides are basically going to be a little bit of a repeat but that really stresses the importance of them. Ionic and molecular substances, ionic substances, well, those are really strongly and tightly held together, whereas our molecular substances, like CH4 or something like that, well, CH4 is, I'm sorry, a bunch of weak interactions that hold molecules of CH4 together. Now, ionic substances and molecular substances have different physical properties. For example, an ionic substance is typically, typically, and this is a great test question, is typically going to be a solid at room temperature. And to be completely honest with you, most of the time when you think about an ionic substance, you're thinking about it as a solid. Now, one thing that I want to make an important distinction on is that if you get table salt and put it in your hand, okay, that's salt as an ionic solid. Now, if you take that salt and you pour it into a glass of water, what happens to that salt? Well, it dissolves and dissociates. Now, 
if you drank that salt water, you would probably say, oh, well, I drank salt water or this was salty water or something like that. You're just think about like the, the, the thing that you're drinking is water basically with a hint of salt. I, I bring that up because you would never say after you pour a little bit of salt into a glass of water and you drank it, you would never say, Ooh, I just drank liquid salt because you know that the majority of that, that cup or that glass, the stuff that's in there, the majority of it's water. Yeah, sure. There's salt ions in there, but the majority is water. So you know that that's not really the case. Now, with that in mind, and, you know, I mentioned this the other day, ionic substances, well, they can melt. They have a very high melting point. After something melts, it can boil. Melts from a solid to a liquid. Yeah, that can happen. So you could get table salt and heat it up a whole lot and get it to transition to a liquid. Then something with a high boiling point. Well, a boiling point is significant when you have a liquid going to a gas. Now, just as you can make, well, liquid out of NaCl, could you make a gas out of liquid NaCl? You could. Is it going to take a lot of energy? Yes, it will. And in fact, A rough estimation of the melting point of something like NaCl. I think I feel like NaCl is just a good compound to use as the uh, your ionic substance. That's going to have a melting point. So for it to go from a solid to a liquid. So if you got table salt and you put it in a, you know, some sort of pan or something like that, you're going to have to heat it up to about 800 degrees Celsius. Okay, that's close to approximately 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I'm going to keep these both in terms of degrees Celsius though for simplicity's sake. Now if you took that table salt and heated it up to say 900 degrees, then you'd have, well, you'd have a liquid salt. If you were to continue heating it and you heated it to approximately 1400 and around 50 degrees Celsius, 1450, well, then you'd be hitting close to the boiling point. So essentially, if you heated this up to 1500 degrees, you would have gaseous <clears throat> salt, gaseous NaCl. Now, if you compare that to, and really to stress, like if you made a glass of of salt water, that water has a boil has a melting point of zero degrees Celsius and a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. Now, if you made a super saturated and a really, really salty solution, salt water is going to have salt, I'm going to say salt H2O is going to have a boiling point of something like 105 degrees Celsius or something, depending on the amount of salt that you add to that. So the vast majority of that, that physical property, that, that melting point is largely dictated and impacted by the water as opposed to the salt. Salt, if you heat it up to 900 degrees Celsius, well, it's going to liquefy. Heat it up to 1500, well, it's going to become gaseous. Now, there are industrial purposes and values for this. Um, they can conduct electricity very well whenever they're liquids. Now, your molecular substances, they're going to be a gas, liquid, or a solid at room temperature compared to an ionic substance, which almost all of them are going to be solids at room temperature. They're going to have low melting and boiling points. They're not going to conduct electricity when they're liquids. Now, what those low melting points are, let's take a compound like CH4. And I got to toggle over to see exactly what this is. I think CH4 is somewhere in the area of like 60 degrees Celsius. Boiling point. 
Okay, so our boiling point is okay. No, I'm, I was okay. Then I gotta get my melting point. Okay, so now CH four is if you made solid cubes of CH four or methane, <clears throat> which I mean, this is kind of to simplify it, but um, methane is a gas that people produce. Methane is a gas that cows definitely produce. Um, that is a substance that is a gas at room temperature. And the reason that it's at room temperature is because the boiling point, where we're going from a liquid to a gas, the boiling point is negative 161.5 degrees Celsius. So, zero degrees Celsius, methane's a gas. Negative 100 degrees Celsius, methane's a gas. Now, if you were to drop down to like negative 200 degrees Celsius, that's super cold. It will then liquefy. Now, the melting point for methane is approximately negative 298. I think that's what I saw. Or 296.5 <clears throat> degrees Fahrenheit, or sorry about that, I actually misread that. Um, this is negative 180.2 degrees Celsius. So let me rephrase what I said a minute ago. If you got methane and you dropped it down to negative 200 degrees Celsius, it's going to be a solid. So I'll write that note out here solid when you know this happens from time to time you hit a temperature of negative 200 degrees celsius <clears throat> methane is going to be a liquid at i'm going to call that negative 170 degrees celsius and a gas at anything greater than negative 161.5. So negative 160, it's going to be a gas. Now, that's one example. There are other compounds like ethanol, for instance. The ethanol, I think, is, has a boiling point somewhere around like 70 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius. Okay, so um, ethanol has a boiling point Okay, there we go. Yeah, methane has a, or sorry, ethanol <coughs> has a boiling point where it goes from a liquid to a gas at approximately 78 degrees Celsius has a melting point of approximately 0 0.03 degrees Celsius. So these temperatures, you know, they're all, they're all low. Um, there aren't too many molecular substances that you have to heat up to, you know, a thousand degrees in order for it to become a liquid. Whereas ionic substances, you absolutely do. Now, which of these solids is likely to require the greatest amount of energy for it to melt. We have sodium fluoride, ice, carbon dioxide, and sucrose. Now, we're going to go starting from the left over to the right. Sodium fluoride, NAF. Maybe you've never heard of that, but one thing that I want you to be able to do is to be able to look at that compound and be like, Sodium's on the left-hand side of the periodic table, fluorine's on the right-hand side. Therefore, this is an ionic compound. So what do we know about ionic compounds? They have high melting points and high boiling points. So that requires a, a lot of energy to be input. Ice, water, okay? So that's a molecular compound. 
And we know approximately what those are because those are our standards. It freezes at zero degrees Celsius and it uh, vaporizes at 100 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> Next up is dry ice. I mentioned this last time and a handful of people chimed in with this answer. What does dry ice do? I mean, dry ice is great for like a party or something like that because of the fact that it goes from a solid straight to a gas at room temperature. It's going to very easily do that. And heck, right now, that's CO2 that I just produced. So for that to melt, and I would say that this question actually has a little bit of a tricky aspect to it. Um, if you're considering all of these different options and kind of weighing them, um, then last but not least is sucrose. Sucrose is a molecular compound, and you might be thinking, man, sucrose making that a, a liquid? I don't know if I can visualize that. You absolutely can. Caramel. Caramel is the liquid form of sucrose. You're heating it up so much that it basically almost liquefies. Now this question, let's go back to this question. And I want to start at the last word, melt. Okay. If we jump back a couple of slides to right here. I'm going to circle one word. Melting. That's a super important word here. Um, in order to go from a solid to a gas like CO2 does, it's going to go from a solid to a liquid to a gas. So it's going to go through all these stages. But it's worth noting that that is the change that's transitioning, or that's the transition that's happening for the solid CO2. It's going from a solid to a liquid to a gas in order for, well, the, the state that we visualize. But this question is asking about melting. So this is really just solid to a liquid. Do we ever talk about liquid CO2? Not really. But it's important to know that's what's, what's typically happening, um, or that's what's happening. What we're accustomed to seeing is that dry ice go directly from a solid to a gas in a process known as sublimation, which if we look at this phase diagram right here, solid to a gas, that transition can happen, but you have to be under the right, at, at the right pressure. Now, let's go back here to our question. And our question really is asking, which one of them requires the greatest input of energy for us to melt? And the way that I kind of think about this is, you know, we have one good uh, reference temperature for our NACL. At 800 degrees Celsius, it will melt. And at 1450, it will vaporize. We know that, or, sorry, then to put that into context, the way that I kind of think about this is would I have to get specialized equipment for this to make a phase transition? For something like sodium fluoride, if the heating, if the melting temperature is like 500 degrees Celsius, yeah, you're not going to do that on your range oven. Then if we look at ice, okay, that ice there, well, that's going to go from a solid to a liquid, and that could be done at room temperatures. That doesn't require a lot of energy. And this question was asking about the greatest input of energy. So we could almost take these last or these middle two and be like, well, ice is going to require a little bit more energy because at room temperature, it's going to take, you know, 20 minutes for that ice cube to melt. Whereas in that same 20 minutes, that dry ice is going to completely vaporize. Now, sucrose is a little bit of a, a lone wolf and almost a curveball because that's a molecular compound and it can melt when the temperature is over like 100 degrees Celsius. Or, yeah, 100 degrees Celsius. So it's an attractive alternative answer. But the way that this, the way that this can be boiled down is, excuse the pun there, 
But this can be looked at uh, simply as, is this an ionic compound or a molecular compound? Because the ice and dry ice, we can kind of cancel those. And we're left with sodium fluoride and sucrose. Whichever one is the ionic compound, that's going to require more, ener er, more energy input. So A, sodium fluoride. Now, ionic versus molecular solutions. One thing that's really important to recognize about molecular solutions versus ionic solutions is that, well, molecular solutions cannot and do not conduct electricity, whereas ionic solutions absolutely do. Because when we have all those charged ions in the solution, that basically gives a place that the electricity can bounce off of. So ionic solutions conduct electricity, molecular compounds do not. Now let's take a look at this video that we got here and see if that works as expected. Oh, it does not. Let me check that one more time. Video. Okay, it's gonna open up the browser. I'll switch over in just a second. Here, what we've got is, let me zoom back. So this is the compound methanol being added to water. And just checking, does it go into solution? And you can kind of gather that they blend it together, but there's definitely like a, a haziness to the solution now. But now, Let's go back to our states of matter, because now what we're going to do is we're going to do a FET simulation. I'm going to share my browser in just a second so that you guys can see what we're looking at. So if you look at this simulation screen, essentially what you've got is you have a container with water in it, you have a salt shaker, you have a water faucet so you can add more water, and then you've got your solute. For this, we're going to default to using sugar. And then essentially what we're going to do is ask the question, well, what happens whenever we add salt or sugar to this mixture? What happens when we add more water to it? Does anything happen? So with that ready to go, here is our um, system that we're working with. We've got, like I said, our salt shaker, our water vessel so that we can add more. And, okay, good, everyone can see that. Now, the thing that I want to draw your attention to first is that the initial temperature, or sorry, the initial uh, water volume is approximately one liter. Boom, right there, okay? The next thing that we can do is add salt. And what I'm gonna do is just go ahead and think that this is, no. Oh, I gotta, I gotta go back and forth because to actually program the salt. So I'm adding more salt, salt, salt. And if you look in the upper right-hand corner, you can see that I've got a solution that has, well, it's got a lot of salt in it. It's a high concentration salt solution. I think I'm gonna stop right around here. And I'm gonna show my values. I've got the Concentration is 1.270 moles per liter. We haven't really talked about moles, but basically there's this amount of salt in this uh, solution. Now I'm gonna close the show values and I'm gonna take my conductivity. I'm gonna put both of my electrodes in the same solution. And does my light light up? Seemingly. Now, let's see what happens whenever I add more salt. 
Does anything happen? Oh, there's a subtle difference. So maybe I'll try it a little bit more. What happens to the, the sunbeams? Well, the sunbeams seem to kind of grow out based on the amount of salt. And just to confirm that I'm going to re remove my salt, now I'm going to add salt. And I can see the bun sunbeams, not the, yeah, the sunbeams that are protruding from this bulb. So the more salt that I add, the brighter the solution gets. Now I'm going to reset this, remove that, and I'm going to switch over to a molecular compound, sugar. Okay, you know, I, I... I have added sugar and I have continued to add sugar and my light is not illuminating. You know what I can do though? So I can release some of the water from my container. I'm gonna drop the volume down which is really just going to mean that my concentration has gone up. So now my solution is more concentrated because the volume of water is lower and the salt or the sugar, I'm sorry, is higher. So molecular compounds don't really conduct electricity well. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch my solute over to salt. I'm going to add salt on top of this sugar. See what happens. <gasps> the presence of that salt was adequate to turn that light on. So ionic compounds help conduct electricity. And they're very valuable in that sense. Now, what we're going to continue on with is basically our, well, let's see, what do we have left in our lecture? We don't really have anything. So... You know, you can play around with this tool, um, look at the, I guess, the ability of a solution to, um, the ability of a solution to illuminate a light based on electrodes being in a solution or not. And that'll about do it. So I hope this was helpful and I hope that you have a, a great weekend. Um, we'll be back on our regular schedule on Monday, but until then, I will see you. Now, there will not be any top hat questions from today, uh, but there will be some, um, there will be at least one quiz. I think there's two quizzes and they're both due on Sunday. Um, check your due dates and you should be good. In addition to that, go ahead and if you've had trouble with top hat, uh, Proctorio, there's a quiz. Please practice it. Make sure that you're good to go on Proctorio. All right, everybody. Have a good one. Bye.